This streamlined video provides a glimpse into a special conference for C-level management that need to get their company unstuck and into a system of sustainable growth. This fast-tracked half-day session will address overcoming siloization, the mortal enemy of enterprise-wide transformation, innovation, and sustainable revenue growth. So let's begin with our first reason on why you should attend. One in four big companies were mid-sized just five years ago. These companies were driven by a sense of urgency that to maximize their growth, they would need a significant transformation. Some of you may share the same urgency, but may be left wondering what kind of transformation would make the difference, and could I even pull it off? If size and growth matters, a company must first break through siloization. It is the silent killer of company growth, innovation, competitive advantage, and especially attracting and keeping the best talent. But how companies appear on the surface can be deceiving. They look to be strong, great market share, brilliant leadership, and too big to fail. Every business unit and function appear to be running on all cylinders with great efficiency. However, many upper-level managers can be in the dark about the real health and potential growth of their own company. When, in fact, inside you'll find a broken system. This is all caused by the company operating as distinct silos or separate businesses within a business. There's little or no communication, shared information, or regular collaboration across company lines. There are no teams created from across the enterprise to attack the big challenges. Siloization contributes to this broken system by keeping the business units, managers, and staff separate under the disguise of accountability. CEOs desire excellence, but this siloed system is incapable of producing it. Siloization is causing CEOs many sleepless nights, and according to multiple surveys, they include being blindsided by surprises about their company, customers, and the marketplace, not enough meaningful data that's actionable, too much pressure on cost-cutting as the magic bullet. The executive team's performance is not collaborative. They don't share. The entire company doesn't seem to have a sense of urgency. And too many employees simply just don't get it. Do we really know how an effective business operates? The classic view is that a business is a combination of separate parts. That's how business is taught in universities. We seek to optimize each part, and each part has a separate management structure and hierarchy for accountability purposes but it's this approach that has led to siloization over the years. Here's just one example of when two silos don't work well together. Many companies don't have a sales and marketing department. They have a sales versus marketing battle. Sales and marketing have been made overly responsible for the company's number one asset, customers. Whenever there's a problem about customers or specifically sales, these two units seem to shoulder most of the blame, even though other business units and market conditions are usually the cause over 90% of the time. The other units have also fallen under siloization, making them incapable to help the situation. The cure for siloization is enterprise system thinking. This is the way to maximize people, places, and things in your company through the culture of continuous cooperation. This very fast-paced half-day conference will expose siloization's causes and reveal how to identify the untapped resources and revenues locked within your company. A company has many parts, and obviously there are many more than what you see here. A system is made up of parts or units that do not have a reason for existence that are independent of the larger system it serves. Parts cannot have individual goals apart from the system, and the parts that act independently of the system will eventually make the entire system run worse. It's not a tangled web. It's a culture of cooperation. In essence, you develop the boundary-less company, as Jack Welch of GE describes it. Here's a graphic example of siloization. This isn't a car. You have a lot of well-made parts that are disconnected, but they don't serve the purpose of the system. If sales, marketing, operations, or finance work independently from each other, how can they possibly work in a maximized way in meeting the ultimate goals you have for your company? So if you took the finest parts of the best cars of the world, such as a Rolls-Royce engine, Mercedes transmission, John Deere tires, and etc., you would not have the best car in the world. You wouldn't even have a car. None of the parts fit. They can't interact with each other. Now this is a car, but not because the parts are merely connected. The parts are connected to serve the purpose of the system. The system was not designed for all the parts to work or even for the car to move. The car was designed for the transportation of another system, people and things. A car is a delivery system. Now here's a leader who really got the dangers of siloization. Steve Jobs rejoined Apple in 1997 and immediately destroyed company barriers, most product lines, and some egos too. He even allowed product managers to cannibalize other Apple products to make new ones because he said if Apple doesn't do it, other companies will. This is why Apple invented the iTunes and Sony did not. 
He knew the secret to protecting Apple's market leadership was to keep ahead of the curve, even at the big risk of competing with an existing Apple product. Plus, during this time, their market share went up from $21 a share to over $370. System thinkers are all around you. Warren Buffett calls them wonderful businesses. System thinkers are holistic in culture and management style, and they're relentless in maximizing tangible and intangible resources. Peter Drucker once said there is more competition within corporations than between them, and the internal kind tends to be less ethical. So what's standing in the way? During this conference, we're going to brainstorm about the culture of your company. The culture of cooperation is a culture of sharing, collaborating teams that are designed to solve problems. Ideal team members are cooperators, learners. They love to mentor and share. They're intellectually honest and do not manipulate or exploit. We're talking about an open system that encourages communication and collaboration through intensive problem-solving sessions. There are those who will not make good team members, though. Money, power, position, competition are their primary driving motivators. They don't play well with others. They have attitude, and their negativity is like a virus that will infect the entire team. In today's world, the manager's job has changed. The people work in the system. The job of the manager is to work on the system, to improve it with their help. Systems thinkers use their existing resources and invite the right people to be on their bus, as Jim Collins would say. So who should be on your bus? We're going to explore this. You're going to be choosing people who have the greatest passion because they can influence all the neutral people to greater thinking and productivity. When it comes to building teams, where do you start? What are the things at the top of your list, both short-term and long-term? Perhaps the top of your list could be customers. It might also include operations. A team must be developed to address each of them. Your enterprise-wide customer value team must pursue knowing all things about customers, and we're going to go into some depth about how to better manage your customer asset. We're going to be exploring Deming's 14 key principles rediscovered for mid-market companies. Number one is why a constancy of purpose must be communicated throughout the entire company. Number two, the improvement and monetary benefits when you eliminate fear. Number three, how everyone can and will want to improve constantly. Number four, how vigorous self-examination can expose easy-to-fix flaws and create opportunity. Number five, getting everyone on board to pursue transformation as a personal responsibility. And nine more ways to initiate systems thinking in your company that will empower management and employees alike. During the conference, there will be an active interchange among the attendees. Together with your peers, we will explore your specific challenges caused by siloization and how to affect transformation into the boundaryless system thinking enterprise. We're going to do group exercises, such as asking the attendees to participate in a series of problem desolving scenarios, such as improve the culture you change the game. In one sentence, describe your corporate culture. List each business unit that has any effect on your customer relationships or value. Do they collaborate on a regular basis? Are your sales and marketing units in silos? Here's a scenario. What would happen if they were combined into one unit? Also, do you know who your MVP customers and prospects are? And is there a strategy for each? Have you ever built a team to attack a specific business problem relentlessly? This one is actually very important, if not provocative. What is your company really best at? Could this sustain a much larger company? Do you have the right system in place to support this? Now to recap, this conference will be addressing how to recognize siloization in your own company, why system thinking is the key to enterprise transformation, how system thinking unifies people, places, and things, and uncovers new avenues of growth and profits, and finally, a breakout session, interactive problem desolving among your peers. Request a systems thinking half-day session for your organization, because afterwards you're going to discover that you already have all the resources you need for transformation.